We welcome Professor Mark Blythe uh, from Brown University, uh, a professor of international economics and an expert in austerity and the euro. And uh, we welcome you, Professor Blythe, to the capital of austerity, <laughs> Athens. The floor is yours. So, let me go back for a minute. Twelve years ago, there was a crisis. And there are two stories about the, how this happened. Now, as we said before, is it malfeasance or is it stupidity? And I said, well, why choose? So I'm going to give you an example of this on a macro level. So there's a sort of official story of the crisis. We can do very quickly. And then we'll fill in some of the details on what actually happened, which you have already said. Right? So we'll just do this as our setup. So here's the picture that matters. You may have seen this. This is the convergence in bond yields, what you, interest you get paid for holding a bond. Uh, in the Eurozone and what became the Eurozone basically from 1990 to 2011 when the crisis kicks off. The, the clue is the red line is Greece, right? Now, the first story about this is about the ECB. So, you used the phrase, I think you used the phrase, Deutsche Bank über alles, right? When you basically say, all right, everyone who has a printing press, put it away. What you're doing is you're saying you will no longer have to worry about what they call exchange rate risk in a bond, right? You can't touch that anymore because you don't print your own money. Also, you won't have to worry about interest rate risk either because you have control of an independent money supply in the same way. So what that means is far-sighted bond traders and other people in finance can look at this picture and say, how much am I getting paid for holding a Greek bond just now? 20%, that's really sweet, but there's a lot of risk in that bond. So thank goodness that by 1999, those Germans are going to be running the show, and none of those Greeks or French people or Italians will have a printing press anymore. And that way, I will pay less interest rate, they will get rewarded less interest rate, you will pay out less interest rate as a sovereign for holding these bonds. So as EMU came closer and closer and closer, the interest rates converged. Then they were almost indistinguishable from each other. We all became Germany. Then when the crisis hit, it discovered we were not Germany. Now, what caused us to discover we were not Germany? Well, I would have thought the first clue was none of you were talking German. But that was just me. This is the other side of the story. The red line in this case is Germany. Germany is the exporter, that's the one running the surplus. You notice that over the same time period, everybody else begins to run a deficit. That's significant. Why? Because you were all spending too much. You see that interest rate convergence made it really, really cheap to borrow money. So you borrowed all this money and then you spent it. Shameful. Terrible people spending all that money. And you see, Germany spent the least because they're good people. And Ireland and Spain and Greece spent the most because obviously you're bad people. And when you spend all that money, what that, is that going to do? It's going to erode your unit labor cost, your wage competitiveness. Suddenly, you are going to become very expensive. You're not actually able to make money in the world anymore. That's why you have those deficits. You see how all of this comes together, right? In sum, cheap credit and rising wages, too much expenditure from the government, made these unsustainable increases in external debt you're borrowing. And then when the mortgage crisis hit and bank lending dried up, bond yields exploded, Europe fell into crisis. Ta-da! The official version of the story. Now, it's pretty plausible, and you can even get numbers that kind of work with that. But is that really what happened? There's something missing in this story that Nikos talked about. Let's have a look at this one. This is my favorite advert from America in 2005. Citibank ran an advertising campaign that cost them $100 million just for the adverts. This is an example of one of these adverts. It says, open a cravings account, not a savings account, a cravings account. And what does that tell us? It tells us that there's a thing called overborrowing but there's also a thing called overlending. And banks love overlending because through overlending you get leverage, and leverage amplifies your profits. So let's run that story again, but think about overlending rather than overborrowing. And that's what I wrote in this piece in 2015 
and I got hate mail from all over Europe, so I knew I was right. Here's what the story is. Let's do this again. I'm a finance person. I get paid 20% for holding Greek debt, and some bastard's going to take that away from me. That bastard's called the ECB. Shit. So I've got seven years left of enormous spreads. Those spreads are going to come down. Why? Because people will buy the spread, and as they buy the spread, because it's going to go down, it will go down even further. It's a volume effect. So how do you make money when the spread is going down? You have to buy more of it. And I will buy more of it because it's getting cheaper, which means that the government would be idiots not to lend it to me. And let's face it, it's guaranteed, right? Because now they don't have a printing press. Now the Germans are going to be in charge. What could possibly go wrong? So here's the fun bit. This is the debts gone bad in 2011 of the banks of France, Netherlands, Portugal, and Germany. Oh, look. One third of French GDP are debts from periphery sovereigns stuffed into their banking sector. And they don't have a printing press either. See, it's really handy to have a printing press because when that happens, you can print your way out of trouble. That's what the Brits did, and then they still did austerity because they're morons. The result of this was that's Eurozone GDP. That's the bank assets of the Eurozone in 2012. The Americans had too big to fail. We managed to build too big to bail on a continental scale. Here is the Americans, American GDP, American bank assets. It's 112 to 100%. Here's France. Yeah, that's what went wrong. So if you didn't bail that out, an asset footprint 4.3 times the French economy was about to come crashing down on a French sovereign that somehow thought it was a good idea to give away its printing press. So if you wanted to stop a bank run around the bond markets of Europe as everybody tried to sell their way out of us before the shitstorm hit, what would you have to do? Well, you'd have to bail out those banks. But you do that by pretending to bail out Greece. So the Greek bailouts, as you will record, was 110 billion in standby and loans in the first three years, followed by 20 billion from the IMF and 145 billion, which now sits in the ESM, in Luxembourg in a private company at an interest rate of 1.39 percent. 27 billion stayed in Greece, which means that over 200 billion went right through as a conduit and went straight back to PMB Paribas, went straight back to Deutsche Bank, went straight back to Commerce Bank, and all the people who were over lending to start with. We know this because by 2013, Greece was running a surplus. It had no need to borrow. Why were you giving it money? You were giving it money because it was a pipeline. The rest of the funds went through Greece, right back to the French and German banks who did the over lending. Then you do austerity, why? Because you have to stabilize those budgets. Because if you can't run a surplus when the whole economy is crashing, it's called a depression. Unfortunately, Alessina was mentioned, there was no confidence fairy. For those of you who forgot how insane this was, let me give you the short non-technical summary of the expansionary austerity thesis. Imagine that you work in, let's say, Spain. You work in the private sector, your partner works in the public sector. You get instant laid off because you have a really shitty labor contract. But don't worry, my partner works in the public sector. Oops, along comes austerity. That partner now has one third of their income left. I've just suffered the 60% income drop. But don't worry, you see, I have long-sighted expectations. Looking at the future value of taxes versus welfare transfers, I am able to calculate that just a few years from now, we will have an expansion which will make the crash worth it. Buoyed by this, I run out to Ikea and buy a couch, thereby ending the recession before it starts. That is literally the logic that the EU peddled for doing this stuff. Growth and real incomes fell. Then they decided to tighten up with a six-pack. This continued to 2015. A weak recovery kicks in in 2017. Now, what did this do to everyone? 
let's push the story forward. This is a rather complex table, forget the bits and brackets, I just want to explain. This is a thing called the growth models table. And what it does is it looks at whether a country's export sector or domestic economy is more powerful in very crude terms, right? So if you do nothing but exports, by definition, you will have a small and weaker domestic economy. You want to keep prices and wages down. Welcome to Germany. Welcome to the northern exporters. On the other side, if you've got a weak, uh, strong domestic economy, a weak export sector, you're going to be reliant on pooling in demand from somewhere else in a different form through transfers of money. Think London, think Britain, think consumption, think the city of London. The story is, prior to all this happening, the EU had a whole variety of different growth models. The way that Greece was allowed to grow was through consumption. Your major exports are still essentially booking somebody else's bum sitting on a beach as a service as export, right? Italy had a very similar sort of model. France was surprisingly similar as well, although more industrial and some exports as well. The Brits were different, the Scandinavians were different. What happens after the crisis is everyone was meant to become more German, remember? What did that mean? Everybody has to run an export surplus and tighten up their budget. It happened. Everybody started running a surplus very, very quickly. Now, there's a thing in life called the fallacy of composition, right? The whole has to be different from the sum of the parts. And if you have a big financial crisis in East Asia in 1997, and the response of all of East Asia is, we're going to start running a surplus against the rest of the world. And then the EU does exactly the same thing. There's only one third of the world left that's running the corresponding deficit. That's the Americans, that's the Brits, that's the consumption economies. So all the variety of different growth models in Europe, which made Europe very robust to shocks because you had different types of economies that could resist in different ways, got effectively reduced down to two. Germany and its export chain in Eastern Europe, a very similar model in the other frugal countries of the north, and then the south, and the south is locked because the south is driven by domestic consumption, but you're not allowed to use fiscal policy. You have to run a surplus. So after 2015, the commission figured out this doesn't work. So they began to go sotto voce on the deficit. France really began to run a deficit on the choir. Italy begins to run a deficit on the choir. And the ECB, let's bring this back to the Euro, starts to engage in massive programs of quantitative easing. Why? Because what you're doing is, remember those yields? You're keeping them down again. Because you haven't recovered, you've just suppressed. Greece, as you can see, is still driven by travel and tourism. It's not the best business model in the world, but it's not the worst. But it is one that is determined by two things, the real exchange rate and how effectively you can determine the level of consumption in the domestic economy. If those two things are constrained as they are in the euro, then you will never file at full capacity, regardless of what your economy looks like. Once again, we're in a position of everyone is running an export surplus. Those exports have to be recycled. They can't go back into the domestic economy because they will cause prices and wages to go up, which we would all like, but it would be bad for the exports. So the exports have to find another destination. And what do we find? The North is running an export surplus. The South, once again, still isn't because of these constraints. It's locked in. It's very hard to get out of this. Now, we had COVID and all the spending, and there was going to be the new Hamiltonian moment, which I got confused by because I thought Hamilton was a musical. I never quite understood this. But anyway, apparently we're going to have a musical, and the musical was going to change everything. Come on, that's a joke, folks. Come on, let's, let's lighten up a bit. Um, and here's all the fancy things that they did. That's, that's a lot of money. That's definitely a lot of money. So, you know, has this really changed things? Well, as we know, Merkel said, Euro bonds will never happen in my lifetime. They still haven't. We've got this. Is this a euro bond? We're not sure. Half the money that's been assigned hasn't actually been spent or given out. So mm, we're still a little bit unclear about this. Has Europe returned to growth? Well, there's what happened since the crisis. You're barely above zero until COVID. You have a huge collapse and then a massive resurgence. The massive resurgence is just the other side of the collapse. And maybe we're at a higher growth rate. Maybe not now, and we'll see why in a moment. The really interesting one is the real per capita GDP share of German GDP of Greece. 
you're now at 45% and you'll get back to 50% of Germany by 2060. I mean, that's an incredible fall in GDP for any country to have gone through. For anyone to declare this other than absolute failure is really just taking the piss. Now, how's that recovery feeling? The blue line, 99 to 2007, is when we saw that convergence in living standards. And Nikos talked about the divergence that's happened since then. 2008 to 2018, even the best case, Ireland, hasn't gotten back to where it was before in terms of how fast it was growing before. In the Greek case, it is decidedly negative, and also with Italy. And Italy is actually the really dangerous one from the point of view of the Eurozone as a whole. Now, having said all that, let me sprint for you a few other things that are of importance. Things changed. When you study this stuff, when you talk about European economic things, you tend to forget there's another world out there. And the other world changed quite drastically. The first one is, I live in America. Woo, watch out for this one, folks. Uh, China, by the way, the clue was in the name. They were a communist party. We just forgot that. It's just really weird. Uh, the EU gets caught in the middle of all this stuff, and the key idea I want to talk about is a little bit to do with climate change, the distributional politics of climate. So let's start here. Here's a very simple way to think about American politics that people don't do enough of. Uh, the bottom map is the Trump electoral map. The top map is the states that produce the most carbon. It's not a perfect fit, but it's pretty close. What happened was in 1971, one in five jobs in America was in autos and one in three in related industries. It's a carbon economy. Oil shocks in the 70s and the shift to services in the 1980s basically residualized these carbon assets in particular states. You can run from Alaska to the Dakotas, through Oklahoma, down to East Texas, along to Louisiana, straight up to West Virginia. I call it America's crooked carbon smile, and it's every state is hardcore Republican. So US political polarization is really a climate transition rust ga trust game among states. And the people who are carbon heavy do not trust the blue states on the coast to bail them out. And for good reason, because I wouldn't trust them either. Now, what does this mean? It means that the US commitment to decarbonization that Europe takes quite seriously, at least in comparative terms, is very much in doubt. This guy outside January the 6th, given at the Mussolini salute, is likely to be a very serious Republican leader going forward. They are now a right-wing populist party. They are climate change denialists, not because they're stupid, but because the business models of their core states are all carbon dependent. Biden's going to lose ability to pass legislation later in 2022. They will be back in power in 2024. At that point, there will be a 10-year carbon binge. And Europe can forget all the stuff that it's happily singing just now about unity, transatlantic alliance, the Ukraine effect, and everything else. American domestic politics is going to override this quite drastically. And it's going to be globally destabilizing. Why? Because the pull out of Afghanistan belies an enormous increase in US military spending, particularly on the Navy, that's going up over the next decade. That's basically aimed at defending Taiwan if China invades. And if what we now know from the Trump administration was Trump's vision of NATO was basically to privatize it. What he wanted was to basically pull it out and treat it as a contract, whereby if Poland was worried about Russia, the Poles can pay for the Americans to come and put in a couple of brigades. That's what it was going to be. I'm not saying it's going to go back to that, but it's a far cry from the fantasy that's been pushed around in the newspapers just now. Now, China, this guy in the background of this shot is incredibly important. You've never heard of him. His name's Wan Huning. Wan Huning was given an award by the American Political Science Association in 1994. He was a political theorist. And he was asked to tour America as a modern de Tocqueville and marvel at how wonderful America was as a democracy. So he did. And he spent a year traveling around America, different political science departments. And he went back and wrote a book called This Place is Fucked. It wasn't actually called that, that was the unofficial title, but that's basically what he came back to. He said, what did you do to your capital stock? Why did you send us all of your manufacturing jobs? What the hell are you doing? The Communist Party picked him up and put him inside an internal think tank. He's been incredibly influential since then. His main targets have been financial tech and entertainment elites. Apparently, there was a dinner he was at when Xi was just rising to power, and he, he posed the following question for this, ver this very tight Politburo dinner, which is the following. 
What exactly does America get for having 400 billionaires? It's a pretty reasonable question. So they have changed. They're turning away from property-led growth and financialization. And here's a thought for the weekend I put up on Twitter a few months ago. Last year, China built more offshore wind capacity than the entire world had in the previous five years. The previous leader was the UK with 10 gigawatts. China built one and a half X that last year alone. How's your transition going? They have to do this. This is what's called a wet bulbs predictor map. Basically, the northeast there on the right-hand panel at three degrees, all those red areas are, are basically uninhabitable for more months, four months of the year. So China has every incentive to get off coal, which is heavily dependent on. They've already banned Belt and Road coal investment. They've declared 2060 as a net zero target. The rumor is they're going to go to 2050. They banned Bitcoin while pushing the digital renminbi, which is very significant. Ramping up green tech investment, dominating the EV market as a strategic goal. And they have that serious risk of heat bulb, wet bulb uh, effects, so they have every incentive to make this happen. Now, why does this matter? It matters because all of this is pegged on the Taiwan question. And we've said before that if his credibility is dependent on this, and they have the capacity to do it, and the US has changed, this could get very, very nasty very, very quickly. And we could already be on that way. Now, if you're the EU and we're thinking about the Europe and the Euro and all this sort of stuff, we're looking inside here. All of this is going on outside and is hugely significant. I, I love this cartoon. I, I, I honestly can't tell the difference. Red, blue, red, blue, it's all the same to me. So what is it that the EU's been doing? I like to call it hide and trade. The de definition of Euro European foreign policy for the past 15 years has been to put as many German businessmen on an A380 as possible, fly them to Beijing, say nothing about human rights, and come back with contracts. That has been the definition of foreign policy. They are beginning to worry about the US stance on China, but at the same time, their export surplus, where do you think it's going? It's not going here, it's going over there. They see green tech as a way to both compete and cooperate with China. The green transition is underway, at least in skeletal form. The structural funds are becoming transition funds. And then along comes the wild card. He's a system spoiler. But if you've been paying attention, he's been planning this since 2008, since the Munich speech. He's been completely clear and consistent on this. The only reason NATO exists is basically to contain Russia. And I'm telling you, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. It's pretty straightforward. The thing is, they are heavily dependent on Russian gas and oil and will not shake it. They might have good rhetoric on this. They're talking about building LNG capacity. Fine, you can build the capacity. Where are you going to get the gas? There just isn't enough of it, right? So you've got a problem. Russia is a swing producer in wheat, oil, and gas and a critical source of rare earths. You're not shutting them off from the global economy for anything longer than you absolutely have to. And the EU militaries are not a credible threat due to decades of underinvestment and, crucially, a lack of anything looking like a common foreign policy. Imagine that there is actually a nuclear exchange, a tactical nuclear exchange over Ukraine in the next few months. Which countries will say no to Article 5? I'm not sure, but I'll bet there'll be a few. And you're meant to have unanimity on that one, so I don't see that one going too well. Now, where do we go from here? Two scenarios. The first one, Russian aggression encourages the EU to accelerate the green transition. The EU becomes a leader in green tech. The EU military is rebuilt. And the EU and the US rebuild the rules-based order. That's basically the Atlantic magazine view of the future. And it's a nice one. Here's another one. Uh, EU dependence on Russia plus stagflation leads to backsliding on the green transition. We become utterly dependent on Chinese green tech. EU abandons NATO. The EU fails to compensate militarily. What happens to the euro then? So let's bring the euro back into the conversation. The euro, or the ECB, is what I like to call, I'm not the only one who's called it this, a leader of last resort. How do we know this? Because when Lagarde became the head of the ECB, she said in her first press conference, our job is not to close spreads. And that cost 14 billion. Literally the most expensive seven words ever said. Their job is to keep bond yields suppressed. Why? Because that's what they did from Draghi onwards. 
doing whatever it takes, the Jedi mind trick with money. It was all about one thing, keeping those yields down. Why? Because you generated even more of them because you bailed out your banks without being honest about it. Then you had a 10-year long recession. So guess what? Greek debt to GDP is now 242. The Italians are at 145. Fitch in 2011, the ratings agency, promised that Italy would be bankrupt once they got to 110. They sailed through it because the ECB will keep buying the debt. The problem is, if it's not your job to close spreads, what is your job? That is exactly your job. And the problem is, if Europe recovers, they're not allowed to buy Italy's bonds. And Italy hasn't grown in 20 odd years. So if your economy is shrinking, your debt must be growing. The ECB is not allowed to buy your bonds anymore. What has to happen to Italian interest rate payments? Whoops! So the ECB has to come back in and start buying the bonds. They can't get out of it. They're trapped. The leadership, that leadership by the ECB and eternal yield suppression is still contingent upon exports. We're still doing it. And the problem is, let's bring in the geopolitics. China wants to make their own stuff. They don't want to be their export hub. They're not going to buy your green tech. They're going to make their own stuff. The US is rediscovering decoupling in tariffs. Geopolitics makes domestic consumption more attractive, but you are running an export surplus against the rest of the world. So you cannot take the money you earn and put it in your domestic economy and consume more because it will make your exports more expensive. So you have a business model problem at the same time that you have a structural finance problem. And the EU rules can't be changed to allow the euro to internationalize to accommodate that because it would blow up the export model. And above all else, that's the red line for the Germans. It's not anything in Ukraine. So you have a double hotel California problem. You can check in, but you can't check out. The ECB is the check-in agent. Welcome to the Hotel California. Please hand over your bonds. I'll keep them liquid forever, but you can't leave. You can't get out of this one. You can check in, but you can't check out. The only way you can check out, unless you have something really clever like a digital currency system, maybe we'll hear about that shortly, I don't know. But the traditional view of this is that you'll have capital flight throughout the single market. If you have, for example, Italy tries to get out, any Italian doesn't have rocks in their head is going to open a German bank account. All those German, Italian euros suddenly become German euros. You have huge imbalances in the system in this weird thing called target two. The central banks can't compensate. Pfft, the whole system falls down. That's the standard story. But you can also change the rooms in the hotel. And what I mean by that is you could, if you had enough political foresight, see these problems coming and adapt to them. If China's not going to play ball and be your export market, if you're not going to declare some kind of wonderful victory for democracy in Ukraine over the long run, if you're strategically dependent on people you don't happen to like, the smart thing to do is to admit it. And what does that also mean? It means getting off of exports. It means the end of deficit fetishism. It means the need for a common debt instrument well beyond the next jet fund. So what is the future for the, future for the next 20 years? Can't become a global currency because it's addicted to exports. Still generating its own risks that meet constant yield suppression, the Hotel California problem for the ECB. We still have very incomplete institutions, still trying to make one size fits all policy. Everybody should become a bit more German. And what we desperately need to do is recognize that not just the South, that all of Europe and the world going forward is going to be reliant upon domestic consumption. And domestic consumption for a properly integrated Eurozone is 440 million people. It's bigger than the US, for goodness sake. If it was actually done properly, it could be kind of amazing. Yet we seem to have, through a combination of malfeasance, short-sightedness, stupidity, dumb luck, and a lack of paying attention to what's going on outside, a set of people who just don't see these as problems. We'll see how it ends up. Thank you. Well, thanks, Mark. That was brilliant, of course, as always. Um, you see why we invited him. 
He's not only brilliant, but he's very entertaining too. Although you didn't laugh at three obvious jokes, so I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the state of this you country. See, they were reading the subtitles when, when, they, when they were watching Shrek. I know. So. That's so. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, Nico, do you want to start with a comment before I comment, before he responds, before we pass the microphone to the floor? Frankly, it was such a tour de force. I was really, I enjoyed it thoroughly, and that it was very uh, edifying. And so, because it was not only about uh, the euro and what went wrong, but you had a geopolitical uh, a scenario that's much more plausible than the standard received wisdom reading of what's going on. So, uh, how can it be so beautiful, you know? And um, of course, uh, things are not as uh, they seem. So not really. I don't have a, I mean, a comment, or I have to let it sit here. Okay. Go on. Everything you said stands. I just want to add a wrinkle to the, the whole thing. Uh, one great advantage of the euro is that it makes any possibility of a wealth transfer from the haves to the have-nots, impossible. Mm -hmm. It's not that you know, liberal democracies have had many ex events of such a transfer, but yeah, 1933, Roosevelt did it, Willy Brandt did it in the late 1960s, early 1970s in Germany, Bruno Kreisky a little bit in Austria, maybe Harold Wilson to some extent in yeah. Britain. <coughs> Papa, Papa Andreu had a, <coughs> had a go just for two or yeah. three years. The euro makes it absolutely impossible, even for Germany. Mm -hmm. Germany has a few more degrees of freedom in that regard. But once you lose the monetary policy tools, all the developments and dynamics, the financial sector developments, mm -hmm. are pushing governments against fiscal constraints. Mm -hmm. So they lose fiscal policy um, levers as well. So suddenly, Democracy is banned. Mm -hmm. If you are an oligarch, the Euro architecture is a wet dream. Mm -hmm. It's a dream come true. So this is going back to a discussion we had earlier. It's not that the people in the know do not know this. They peddle the official story. Yeah. But they do know all this. From my experience, uh, people like Draghi, um, Draghi, and maybe Draghi. <laughs> <laughs> all three of them. Yeah, all three of them understood that, mm -hmm. right? But the political system in every country, you see, one question that your talk leaves in abeyance is, okay, well, if the German business model is so embedded in the German ruling class's mindset and it buggers up everything else. Why can't there be an Italian, Spanish, uh, Irish, Greek um, rebellion? Mm -hmm. The answer is that if you are a Greek oligarch, mm -hmm. an Italian oligarch, a Spaniard in the money, you don't want to do away with this model mm -hmm. because the Troika, call them what you might, will always come to your aid. They will not come to your country's aid. The Troika will always look after you. And together, yeah, mm -hmm. those oligarchs and the Troika will continue the maintenance of the German business model against all rationality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that, you know. So just, just to clarify though, so everyone is on the same page. Are you saying that the lack of ability to meaningfully redistribute comes from the lack of policy tools? or the business model, the deeper one, which is to say, if you are focusing on doing exports, then you have to suppress wages and you have to do consumption. So you have an interest in not redistributing, or are you actually saying the architecture means you can't redistribute even if you want Both. to? Both. Right. Because if you think about it, the architecture, okay, what does the architecture do? The moment you bring, you, you, know, you bind together the drachma and the Deutschmark, mm -hmm. You create a tsunami of lending, as you put it, from Frankfurt to Athens. Mm -hmm. This creates bubbles, 
it creates a false sense of having arrived, of convergence. The bubble bursts. It's you know, just completely deterministic. The bubble bursts, then either you have a Grexit or you have what we had, mm -hmm. which is austerity, which is wage suppression. The wage suppression here then spreads to Germany mm -hmm. via Ireland, via um, France. So you have austerity everywhere. And that is completely functional mm -hmm. to the business model. So the architecture and the business model are one and the same thing. So even countries outside of the Eurozone don't escape this in a different way, even if they're the consumption ones. Think about the discussions that you hear now about inflation. So the simultaneously, there's always two stories. The first one is, well, we have to worry about this because people who are poor, the bottom 40, 60% of the income distribution, they're the ones that suffer the most from rising prices, parentheses, because their wages are so low, close. Um, therefore, we need to raise interest rates to get rid of inflation. In other words, the people who are the most credit constrained, but also pay the most for credit, now have to pay more for credit so that they can pay less for everything else? Parenthesis. That doesn't make much sense the minute you begin to think about it, unless you think about it from the same point of view. What is the ultimate function of all of these architectures? It's wealth preservation. The particular language of central banking calls it price stability, but we should call it what it actually is, wealth preservation. I do like the line, I forget who said it, it might have been Warren Mosler. I'm, I'm MMT sympathetic, but I'm not fully in the camp. But I think it was Warren Mosler who said that increasing interest rates is UBI for the already rich. Yep. And it's a very simple way of thinking about how that architecture constrains, not just in the Euro, but right across the world. Yeah. Yeah. A question. Your analysis of why the European Central Bank cannot afford to wind down its money printing mm -hmm. is clear. There's no doubt about that. I have a feeling that the same thing applies, applies to the Federal Reserve mm -hmm. in the United States. That the American Central Bank cannot abandon all those years of printing money on behalf of corporates and Wall Street. And um, could you comment on that and why that might be so, if it is so? So there's a peculiar way you can think about this, which is it's as if the Fed and the ECB actually did read modern monetary theory and realized that it does apply to them. So let's use it in a very peculiar way. Because if debt is really something that we owe to ourselves, I can just keep doing this, right? Because I have the deepest liquid printing press. So, so long as people are willing to hold dollars, and they have to because you can't really hold any other asset at scale, I can keep adding to this debt pile. Why? Because there's infinite demand for this as a savings asset. So I can keep doing it. And we, we saw this with COVID when the asset manager BlackRock was the consultant to the Fed telling them which assets to put into this index so that when those values fell, they went and indirectly supported those assets. Do you think there might be a slight conflict of interest with an asset manager telling the Federal Reserve which assets to protect in value? Yeah, that's how far we have come in this. So uh, to me, the test on this is, if there is ever a very big collapse in American equity markets, the stock exchange, the, the official line is, you know, we don't go near that. They will be, quote unquote, in like flint. They will absolutely ensure that. There is no way that will be allowed to fall. At that point, what you have is socialism for the rich. I mean, it really is. It's socialism for the rich and capitalism for the poor. And we are three quarters of the way there. The ECB just does this sotto voce. That's all it is. It's just it's the same thing. Their, their problem is slightly different. Italy is Argentina, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. When anyone ever talks about Argentina and finance, it's like, bleh, I don't mean this at all. Argentina had a unique set of problems, which very few people appreciate, which was when Argentina decided that in the 1940s it was going to basically modernize and industrialize after World War II, it had a problem that the Brazilians didn't face so much. It didn't have a sector to squeeze because it was already democratic. You couldn't turn around and squeeze the uh, landowners because the landowners were too powerful in the provinces. 
And you couldn't squeeze labor, as you did in East Asia, for the source of the original savings and capital, because they were part of the Peronist electoral coalition. So it was always difficult for them. But the early stages of post-war growth enabled Argentina to get up to a reasonable level. Then it go into hell in the 70s. The generals come in, etc., And then they commit to foreign borrowing. And that's why they've had the problems that they've had. Now, Italy is very different. People forget this, but the fastest growing economy in the OECD from 1960 until 1990 was Japan, followed by Italy. It was an astonishingly successful growth model. And it started to come apart in the 1990s. Now, we can go into the reasons why, but the bottom line is this. By the time that you get past Berlusconi, you have a very low growth rate and enormous pile of debt. You are to the ECB what the, I the Argentina is to the IMF. You're too big to fail. They cannot allow that one. It will blow a massive hole in the balance sheet, and they can't allow it to happen. So they're absolutely stuck with it. So the best thing for them, bizarrely, is for the north of Europe, their responsibilities is for Europe to have a very strong recovery, preferably one on exports. But if that happens, they have to stop buying the Italian debt, in which case they have a new problem. Argentina shows up in their balance sheet. Etimastite, get serotisas, while they're preparing to put their hand up. What do you say, just playing the devil's advocate on behalf of people who are not here, what, do, what would you say to somebody who says that, you know, they've done a Volcker shock before, mm -hmm. they could do one again. For, for those who don't know what Volcker, the Volcker shock is, στα τέλη της δεκαετίας του 70, ο Κάρτερ έβαλε τον Volcker διοικητή της Κεντρικής Τράπεζας των Ηνωμένων Πολιτειών, τον Πολ Volcker, ο οποίος, για να αντιμετωπίσει το την αύξηση του πληθωρισμού του 1979, ανέβασε τα επιτόκια των Ηνωμένων Πολιτειών από το 6% στο 21%. Δημιούργησε μια τεράστια οικονομική κρίση, Κλείσανε, κλάψανε μανούλες που λέμε, στην Αμερική, στην Ευρώπη, πτώχευσαν μια σειρά από χώρες στην Αφρική, στην Ασία, η Ιουγκοσλαβία και η Πολωνία. Και αυτό άλλαξε τον κόσμο σε πολύ μεγάλο βαθμό. Και από εκεί ενισχύθηκε το χρηματοπιστωτικό σύστημα της Αμερικής την ώρα που κατέρεει η μεσαία τάξη της Αμερικής. Okay, I just explained the Volcker yeah, shock. Fine. Και το ερώτημα που του θέτω είναι και ποιος μας λέει ότι δεν θα δημιουργήσουν ένα νέο Volcker shock. So, the Volcker shock wasn't just about interest rates. The Volcker shock was also about financial deregulation, although that happened in Congress. Once you allow banks to integrate on the scale of the United States and you remove capital controls, as Britain and the United States did it's almost simultaneously in 78 and 79, you begin a process of financial globalization. This is very important for the disinflation story of Volcker because it's not only causing this burnout of domestic capital by making money very expensive, you're allowing money to go offshore to find a return elsewhere. At the same time, you're beginning to globally integrate labor markets. So all of the inflationary pressures going out these very different pipes, things deflate. Now, here's your problem. 30 years later, you've globally integrated capital markets to the extent you have one big global capital market. And when you suppress yields through quantitative easing, when you push down the interest rates to encourage recovery, that money goes somewhere else and it goes everywhere else. It goes to Brazil, who saw their, inter their exchange rates rising. It goes to Turkey, where they've had this, the, the, I saw statistics that said that Turkey has built more hotels in the past 10 years than it had in all other points of its history, mainly in places where they'll never get any tourists. This is called yield tourism. You're out there trying to find something that earns you a bit of money, because at home it's very hard to do so with the interest rate suppression. So here's the Fed's problem. Inflation is 7, 8%. If you want to call that, you have to raise it to 10% nominal to get a 2% real rate. If you do that, you will cause a huge recession in the United States. That means the Republicans come back. The Fed actually don't want that. They're all Democrats. Uh, but the bigger problem is if you do this, all that money sitting in Turkey and Brazil and everywhere else comes flying out of those pipes straight back to the United States you will have the mother of all global financial crashes if that happens. And they know this. So guess what? They've built their own hotel, California. You can raise rates, but never too far.
OK, ερωτήσεις. Hello. Uh, I am going to pose a question, which I have already done uh, to Yanis about two or three years ago. But I would like also uh, an answer with a northern British accent. I would fancy I can what. definitely supply <laughs> that. <laughs> OK. Uh, do you think that uh, Euro was a solution to the problem of uh, American industry and American exports? <sighs> I've got a funny view on this one in that I've never been convinced that the e America needs an outlet for its export market story as much as most people have. Because I see it up operating through the capital account, through the money channel, rather than through the, re the real goods channel. It was certainly the case that Europe up until 1958 was, there was no convertibility between the currencies. And this is when European economies grew their fastest. This is when th the Germans have, you know, the Wirtschaft Wunder, the Italians had the, one, the best, the, the French had le, le Trente Glorious, but the, the really glorious part was the first 10 years. And uh, the Italians had the best one ever, they called it Il Boom, which I just adored. It's so cute, it's like a Cinque Cento. But anyway, at that point in time, you didn't have capital account convertibility. You had a huge, everyone's dollar short. You want to take as much American technology as you possibly can because you're essentially building Fordism at home. And that works for a while. Then there's a kind of fallacy of composition that sets in. You can have Fordism, by which I mean Fordist mass production, organized labor, if you have stable prices of inputs. You can have stable prices of input so long as everyone isn't trying to do it. But the minute Toyota comes online, and the Germans come online, and the Italians come online, and the Brits are already there, you've got too many damn cars. And at that point, the stability of the system starts to come apart. So I see Europe, in a sense, as a response to that. The kind of fallacy of composition at the heart of Fordism that falls apart in the 70s. And that's one part of where Europe comes from. But as with anything very large and complex, there are multiple actors with multiple motivations pushing it. But that's how I would tell that part of the story, if that makes sense, in a North British accent. Should we answer questions one by one or collect a number of answers and then? Ask this, let's take them one by one this okay. time around. Let's experiment. Oso menete o polemos, ke taftochorna klimakonete ke oxinete o ekonomikos polemos. Θεωρείτε ότι στο εγγύς μέλλον υπάρχει πιθανότητα τουλάχιστον για τις ρωσικές ή κινέζικες τράπεζες να δούμε μία πιθανή επιστροφή στον κανόνα του χρυσού. Ooh. The gold bug question. Um, I, I, well, there's a good German word, yain. Yes or no. Um, you already have the gold standard that's called the euro, so you don't really need it in that regard. More seriously, there isn't enough gold in the world at current levels to re-denominate a gold standard without having a crushingly high exchange rate. So even if you tried, it would be extraordinarily painful. The more interesting one is disintermediating with digital currencies. And the, the, I know that Jan is going to talk about this, but to me, I see this happening very much on the state front. There is absolutely no reason why you need to go through dollars if you're doing bilateral trade. It's stupid. It's stupidville, right? Blockchain exists. Nobody knows what to do with it. This might be it, right? You can try that. You can see how it goes. Where I think there's a limit on this, and I mentioned this earlier, is in, on, at the end of all these transactions in the private sector, you need to have something to bank into. So if I'm uh, an Italian firm and I sell to China, I can do a bilateral trade, a digital currency, right? But at the end of the day, do I want to buy euro bonds that don't exist as my savings asset? No. Do I want to buy Chinese bonds? Well, I might, but then they might just tighten the currency controls and then I can't get my money out. Do I want to buy Russian bonds? No thanks, I'll take a pass on that. We know what happened in 96, right? So what's the most obvious thing you can buy? Treasuries. There's more treasury, there's more dollars made outside of America than made inside America because of euro markets. So, so long as you don't have something of that deepness and, and size and liquidity to bank into, if you will, an alternative, digital is good for transactions, but it's too volatile. 
you're stuck in a sense with the dollar and that's the ace in the hole for the Americans. That's why you won't go to gold or, or do anything else, I think. Let, let me get in, into oh. this because we had this conversation last night over dinner. So I'll repeat here what I said in response to exactly the same point. The, it's not contrary to Mark, what Mark said, it's additional Go to it. Um, he's absolutely right. In the end, no currency can challenge the exorbitant privilege, the reserve currency status of the dollar, unless you have a form of debt which is solid, safe, and goes along with it. This is the reason why the euro will never be, or cannot be at the moment, given its architecture, a serious challenger to the dollar. Because if you're selling lots and lots of stuff to wherever, from Germany, right, um, where do you put it? Yeah. Exactly as, as Mark said. But, but the digital one is offering a very cheap system of payments of transactions, which is no, not under the, um, the threat that recently the United States made real vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis Russia. So there are many countries in the global south yep. who are shit scared of what the Americans did to Russia happening to them. They have a lot of exchanges, trade with the Chinese, who have a lot of trades with the Russians, because the Russians do produce, as Mark put up on the screen, a lot of the things that China needs, rare earths, um, military technology, and of course, energy. energy. Yeah, let's not forget energy, oil and gas and stuff. So the digital one is becoming a clear and rising, not threat to the dollar, but addendum to the dollar. Mm -hmm. The moment of truth will come, uh, this is what I said to you last night, when China develops a relationship with countries like Vietnam, perhaps, like um, in Africa, I don't know where, Pakistan maybe, where those countries play for China the role that Europe has been playing for the United States mm -hmm. for the last 70 years or so. Then China can allow itself to drift into being a deficit country. And once it is a deficit country, it will be borrowing. And once it's borrowing, there will be a safe asset and they will need to borrow, so it will be a safe asset. And that's what, you know, that's a scenario. Mm -hmm. But gold, forget about gold. Even the gold standard was not based on, on gold. It was a fiction. I wanted to ask you to answer what you asked before, but maybe it didn't answer or it didn't matter. Μια και πάνω κάτω συμφωνούμε πολιτικά στο τι θέλουμε να κάνουμε, τι πρέπει να γίνει, να αλλάξουμε τον τρόπο που σκέφτονται οι πολιτικοί μας και οι οικονομίες και θέλουμε να βγούμε στους δρόμους να πείσουμε κι άλλο κόσμο. Το ερώτημα είναι ότι όταν τον μιλάμε, του μιλάμε και μας πει ότι ναι, έχετε δίκιο, αλλά πότε θα δούμε κάτι να αλλάζει. Ε, πώς μπορούμε να του πούμε ότι, ξέρεις, από τη στιγμή που θα βρεθούμε, θα τα πούμε και θα περάσει το δικό μας, ε, πότε θα μπορέσει να αισθανθεί κάποιος ότι μάλλον πάμε καλύτερα αντί για να πάμε χειρότερα. Δηλαδή, όχι πότε θα, γίνε, θα καταλήξουμε να φτάσουμε στο τελικό αποτέλεσμα, αλλά πότε θα, βλέ, θα αρχίσει να βλέπει ότι κάνοντας αυτό που αποφασίσαμε να αλλάξουμε πορεία, θα δει φως το τούνελ. Πόσο σύντομα μπορεί να γίνει αυτό. The light at the end of the tunnel. Uh... It depends how far back in the tunnel you are. And we're all at different stages of the tunnel. The problem is that we've developed societies where 80% of everything is effectively owned and controlled by 20% of the population. And as far as they're concerned, they're already out of the tunnel. Uh, that's who politicians pay attention to. There's some very good work by a political scientist called Ben Ansel from Oxford on this. He writes about asset democracy, how basically if you look at the way policies are written, it's all about the protection of assets, assets, ownerships, etc. Um, if we look at the way that economies are being increasingly organized by asset manager firms, the clues in the name, right? I mean, it's basically about protecting the value of those companies and the income streams that they, they generate uh, for, again, for asset holders. So the, the political trick, if you will, is how, how does mass democracy interface with asset-owning capitalism, because that's a new problem. 
right? It's a, what you have to do is to convince people, a smaller amount of people that your preferences are their preferences, but never have those preferences been so far apart. And a, a simple example of this is the Yellow Jackets in France, right? The inability of the French ruling class to think through the consequences of that carbon tax and how it would affect working class people commuting into Paris and other cities rather than sort of the, the budgetary effects is just a great example of that disconnect. So I think that the role of political parties and social movements is to try and make that conversation happen so that asset owners realize that the protection of their assets is insufficient. They need to protect democracy. Democracy is the ultimate best insurance policy over the long run for assets. It's not self-protection. And that's, that's how we need to change that. That's straight out of his book, Austerity, the history of a dangerous idea. Correct? It is indeed. Okay. I'm nothing if not consistent. <laughs> Good. Don't forget that the president of France, the prime minister of Italy, and the prime minister of Greece, they're both ex-asset managers. From GS, yep. <laughs> okay, Pamagalli. No woman has asked a question, so I thought I might try one. In continuation to what you just were talking about, maybe. And I'm thinking, okay, let's uh, uh, hy hypothesize that people really understand that they're the, the majority on the planet, and they get, go out there on the streets and they demand, they, they do a huge revolution, I don't know what, but it happens one day. Uh, is there any chance that they can win? And what would that way be? Because it seems that the powers are so strong that they can struggle ev everything or any, any effort. My favorite, and Americans love bumper stickers. Europeans don't do this. They're little stickers that you put on the back of your car with a slogan that tells you about their politics or their feelings. I, I don't know why I'm meant to care about this, but you know, they all have them. And I see, occasionally I see one that I like, and it's a phrase from baseball applied to climate change. Nature bats last. Nature is the last one that comes into the field and decides the game. And we've never been in this world. What ultimately forces this is going to be climate change. Because climate change doesn't accept an argument. Climate change doesn't care what you think. Climate change is already past the point where we can do uh, anything more than adaptation. So all politics going forward is going to be fought out along that terrain. Sadly, for the United States, that means 10 years of ultra-denial and a turn to the Republican Party and the last giant carbon barbecue, which will produce a lot of GDP, but won't really win in the long term. It's kind of like you know running faster and faster into machine gun fire. The lesson then is what does the rest of the world do? My hopeful version of this is that the EU, in whatever shape or form it's in, really accelerates green investments because it's allowed to do this. So if you look on the sidelines of all this stuff, you find something very interesting. The Germans know this, but they're caught rhetorically in their Sparenkultur complex, the savings over everything, the Schwarze Null and the whole thing. But now you've managed to break it. There's a generational change. And what you begin to notice is everything is off balance sheet. All right. Now, on the one hand, this is truly scary because this is the technologies that brought us the financial crisis, right? It's not really on my balance sheet, it's over there. But if you start chucking a couple of trillion euros into really serious green investment and you buy the stuff that the Chinese have already got working at scale, I'll give you a hopeful story. There's a new paper by Donnie Farmer that shows that if you track a lot of data over a lot of different renewables over time, there's an inverse Moore's law. Every time you double the scale, the price of renewables drops 30%. So if you run this out over 15 years to fifth generation solar, it has now cost 5% of what it did 15 years ago to produce seven times the amount of electricity. That's astonishing. Now, is it going to halt all climate change? No, but you're damn straight that China's going to do it. And if the EU and China work together on this, that opens up a whole set of possibilities. My worry for where I live is the United States gets permanently left behind. That's what's going to weaken the dollar more than anything else. You, you just reminded me, remember years ago, 2016, Donald Trump was asked by some journalist 
why he, op why he denies climate change. Because, and he said because it would be a victory for communism. Yeah. He was right. Yeah, yeah no, uh, yeah, true. <laughs> Never thought of it that way, you're right. So you, you mentioned earlier a blockchain. Yes. Do you think blockchain will be a solution for Europe's crisis uh, and under which conditions, especially taking in mind of this uh, actual uh, political and financial nomenclatura that rules Europe? I'm going to pass much of this over to a true expert on this. To, I have a cynical view of blockchain. Blockchain is a bit like universal basic income. It's a really great idea that people get super excited about, and we're just waiting for one successful test case to show that it works. All right, so I think that it's there. I think it could be used. There are pretty good suggestions out there for how it could be used. Is it going to transform it? I think there's a simple limit to go back to your question about how you mobilize on this. How do we do things, right? If you have to explain to someone that it's money, it's not money. If you have to have half a computer science degree to understand the thing that's going to make a difference in politics, it's probably not going to work. So if we can figure out a way of making digital technologies work in a very simple, common sense way that makes a difference in the lives of people, then they matter. But until we do that, it's kind of a digital UBI. It's a, it's a great idea waiting for a problem to solve. Since I'm going, επειδή εγώ θα πατήσω στην ομιλία μου πάνω σε αυτό, δεν θα πω οτιδήποτε άλλο, πάμε σε επόμενη ερώτηση. So this has been already partially answered, but in your opinion, how would the euro bond affect the current state of the eurozone from a more economic perspective? How would the euro what? How would the euro bond change, oh, the, euro current, bond. Okay, change the current state of the euro and euro? Right, right. Well, it would presume a political organization of Europe that accepts, accepts risk and burden sharing and distribution of risk and burden sharing that currently doesn't exist. So in a sense, it would be like having a successful blockchain, right? It would be the end of the process. I think part of the problem is that, particularly because it's such a technocratic or a situation, that for a long time that conversation has been dominated by economists who think, oh, well, if we just have this bond, then the politics will sort itself out. And it's like, mm, no, no, you need to sort out the politics. Then you'll get the bond. Right, so I think that's how you have to look at it. Hence why you're not going to get from the pandemic special arrangement fund to a bond. Like It just doesn't automatically follow that way. There has to be the will to burden share. And again, to go back to what you were saying, you know, we've, we've, we kind of forget this, right? But the discourse of build, I mean, holy crap. I mean, it was, it was awful. It was truly awful. This, this is meant to be some kind of you know, enlightenment project. Remember, you know, the ode to Europe and all this bullshit, right? Within seven years, what are they doing? They're shouting at each other, shouting racial epithets at each other, right? Northern saints and southern sinners and diesel bloom, you know, spend it all on money and drink. He's the guy who comes from a prostitution capital. Who the fuck is he to tell anyone? I'll add to this, just a couple of vignettes. Uh, we do have a euro bond now, formally, that funds the recovery fund, the Tamiyo Anaptixis, in the sense that it is issued jointly and severally by all the member states of the EU. But size matters. Mm -hmm. It's very small, therefore it cannot be a safe asset. It cannot play the role of the US treasuries, American bonds, right? That's point number one. Uh, point number two, it depends on what you use it for. So they are not allowed to use it, the member states, in order to translate national debt into European debt. Right. Uh, it would be a proper eurobond if it allowed for the Europeanization of parts of the debt, a significant part of the debt. Not one euro will be Europeanized of existing nation state. And thirdly, the way that they designed it, it is as if it was designed it was conceived of as a way to destroy Europe. Let me explain why. Think how, remember how it happened? June 2020, they sat around the table. They said, okay, how much money are we going to borrow together? 750. Mm -hmm. how, many, how many of those billions will Italy take? So many. Greece? So many. France? So many. Before they knew what the effect, the impact of the crisis would be on every country. Mm -hmm. 
And then they gave this money to individual member state governments to spread it around to their mates. So in the end, we created a macroeconomically insignificant eurobond in order to transfer money from poor German workers to Greek and Italian oligarchs. This is what you do if you want to destroy Europe and to make sure that there will not be a eurobond. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you agree. It would be hard to disagree with that. The only thing I'd say is I, I have this abiding image of all human nature, which I got from reading The Guardian once. And it's you, I hope you only read The Guardian once. Just once, just once. But it, it's this picture of the, the Guardian readers tend to have of Americans, which is on the one hand, it's 300 million gun-holding, religious, bigots, racists, who weigh 500 pounds each, lying on a couch with the IQ of a turtle. On the other hand, it's the most Machiavellian foreign policy apparatus the world has ever seen, which has ceaselessly executed every single thing that's ever happened in the world exactly according to its plan. You can't have both, right? Pick one. Or put them together and you end up with a bit of a mess. And sometimes they get what they want and sometimes there's a reason the British call them caught in the act, which is their nickname for the CIA. Um, I think that that's true as a consequence, but I don't think it was how it started as a cause. It's not to say that there weren't people there involved who thought, oh, this is a good one. Oh, I'm sure there were. But that in the end, that's how it turned out. That's it, yeah. So but the, the other, the other thing, they haven't spent most of it. I mean, that's the thing that's incredible about it. After all this time, you're out of COVID and you haven't spent most of the funds yet. Sure, sure. And one very last question, which would that be? He has had his hand up from the start. Mr. Sorry? Blue Shirt has had his hand up from the very beginning. Thank you. You partly answered my question, but I will still like to make it. I recently heard in the news that ESB is, is preparing to launch a digital coin called E-Euro. What are your thoughts about it? Again, I missed this one up. The I, will, I, will, I heard it. He heard that the, the European Central Bank is about to launch a digital euro. Oh, the digital euro. What right. do you think about it? Right. Um, this is all about Facebook, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, back in 2015, Mark Zuckerberg, who looks like a charmless version of Commander Data from Star Trek, um, he, he looks decided, nothing like Commander Data. Yes, he does. I love a Commander charmless Data. version. A charmless version of Commander Data. He does. He looks like if based that Data had a pole up his backside. Are you trick as well? And stop it. Now, <laughs> the serious point, right? Um, he did, had this great idea of let's have Libra, let's have a digital currency for everyone on Facebook. So just what a brilliant scam, right? So Facebook is for 1.7 billion people the internet because the internet you have to pay for, but Facebook you don't. So for like 1.7 billion people, that's a captive audience. Now you could disintermediate every national currency that they're involved with at a fixed exchange rate, take all their real cash, swap it out for digital cash and to get them to trade with each other. Once you do this, monetary policy on a global level becomes completely impotent. So the, the Treasury sat down apparently in an emergency meeting with the Fed and went, okay, what are we going to do about this? So they had a conversation and that got pushed to the side. But then, basically, they took the Chinese one seriously because they were like, hang on a minute, aren't the Chinese doing this? And then, and then loaded it. So it's happening. It's more important in the government space. It was Libra that kicked it off. The ECB is just coming very late to the party. The thing is, it's a very different type of currency, right? Precisely because it's not a reserve asset. When Wall Street says it's going to cash, what they mean is they're buying treasury bonds. It doesn't mean they're actually going to cash, right? When European firms mean they're going to cash, it means, fuck, I'll buy anything, right? Because we don't have a reserve asset. It's totally different. So would that change if they had a digital euro? No, it's precisely the same very restrictive mechanism. It's not as if you're going to magic up an extra trillion in liquidity. Now, given that it's based on a blockchain, if you had individual accounts, you, you could do that if you wanted to, but they just don't want to. So I think that everything's a reaction to Libra. The Chinese one is serious. The feds want to be serious, but it's primarily defensive and they don't know what to do politically because they don't think they can get away with it. And the Euro one, I just don't think is serious. That's my right. I'll just add an ex my own explanation of why they are not serious about it. It's not that they don't want to. I have inside the information which tells me that they are very keen to do it. But they have a constraint that the Chinese Central Bank doesn't have. 
And the constraint is the private bankers. The private bankers right. in the West have an exclusive relationship with central banks. So the only Americans who have the right to hold an account with the Fed, the only Europeans who have the right to have an account with the ECB are the bankers. Okay, this is a very important mm -hmm. exclusivity for them because it's QE comes to them through those bank accounts and then you don't get any of that liquidity and if you want to use a digital euro as we speak, you know, your plastic card, your Google Pay, whatever, you have to have a bank account with the pimps of the banking, of you know, the payment system, which of who are the bankers? The intermediaries. Yes, so the intermediaries. Um, the Chinese central bank are creating digital wallets for anyone without the intermediaries. The ECB would love to do it. They cannot do it because the moment Lagarde says that, she will be decapitated tomorrow by Deutsche Bank, Finance Bank, and the rest. And the same is true with the Fed. It's exactly the same. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.